I think uh, there's some recognition going on right now, <laughs> the way I look at some of you out there. Uh, joining me to moderate this is Jeffrey Morad, and welcome to our final panel featuring perspectives from all the angles, players, coaches, media, and an agent. Last year we had a super agent panel, there was one we left out. He's here now. Welcome David Dunn from Athletes First. Brian Westbrook played at a college, which one? <laughs> Brian's here. <laughs> On my immediate right, staying up with us, because she's so enlightening and so entertaining, is Jane McManus from ESPN. To her right, another all-star running back. We've got them both here today. Welcome, Warwick Dunn. And then a man who needs no introduction in this area, the coach, Dick Vermeil. Jeff, I'll let you kick it off. Great. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thanks to all our panelists. Uh, you know, I'd like to start by just, you know, briefly touching on, you know, kind of the special and unique nature of this panel. Um, you know, we have two former running backs, uh, great backs, all pros. Uh, we have uh, one of them, Warwick Dunn, uh, is a uh, former NFL Man of the Year um, and now a part owner of the Atlanta Falcons. So, you know, brings a perspective that I think is very unique. Brian, certainly similarly uh, as a local player, a local impact player, um, you know, I think uh, we're, you know, we're very fortunate to, to have you. You know, David Dunn, uh, you know, in, in my view, my longtime partner, uh, I think we, I think we hired you 25 years ago or more, but, uh, um, David has uh, has done a fabulous job at you know building a a stellar NFL practice in the area of athlete representation, um, focused primarily on the NFL but other sports as well. But you know players like Carson Palmer and Aaron Rodgers and the names you know we could go on forever. But you know to me to have a perspective like David's. Is, is extremely unique uh, for this panel as well. Jane, you were, you've been introduced twice now. Um, we appreciate uh, a perspective, uh, a media perspective, as we kind of explore where the NFL is today, uh, where it's been in the past. And uh, as we think about you know, leaders in the league, um, I don't think there's a better one than Coach Vermeil. Um, a Super Bowl coach. Uh, I happen to love the fact that he coached at David Dunn and my alma mater, UCLA. But, uh, but you know, I was here at Villanova Law School when, uh, when coach was uh, succeeding on the field with the Eagles. And, you know, it's a real honor to have you and your perspective as well. So I guess, you know, with that further background, uh, my question is, you know, where are we today compared to years past? You know, you've all been involved in the NFL in various capacities over, you know, extensive periods of time. You know, who are the players today? What's the league today compared to, you know, who they were in the past and where the league was in the past? Uh, you know, how have we evolved? So, you know, a thought or two from each. Jane, you want to start? I'm, I'm probably the least qualified here to talk about to say this, but uh, what I'll say is that I think that the NFL is at a crossroads now, it's particularly with some of the the issues of concussion and, and the conscious consciousness issues where they, they're looking at discipline. I think that they're looking at, at how they are um, as a responsible citizen in this and, and what they're going to do going forward to keep the game viable, keep it profitable, uh, and keep people interested in, in, and keep parents interested in sending their kids to Pop Warner and, and continuing to play. Well, I think my perspective is I understand the direction the league is going, but at the same time, looking back over the years, and, and Brian can attest to this, that the game has just changed overall. It's not a physical game anymore. It's all about you know what's uh, the perception that it's a safe game, uh, excitement, but it, 
it takes away from the era that I played in that was, you know, was the, the violent hits, you know, guys are paid on an average of four to five million dollars. Now guys are making 10, 15, 20 million dollars a year. So you can see the evolution of the game change on the field and off the field. Well, you know, I cover five decades in the NFL and I don't think there's any comparison. I just think it's so much better in every category. I started in 1969 as the first special teams coach with George Allen. And I've, I've seen the organizations grow, I've seen the coaches grow, and I've really seen the players grow. And I, I've seen better caliber of players come into the league, better educated, further along, maybe from better family situations, having parents that were now college graduates, or at least some education. And I, I just think it's a far more sophisticated, better overall organization than it ever was when I started in 69, then came here in the 70s, and, you know, and then coached in the 80s and uh, the 90s at the Rams and the 2000s at the Chiefs. Uh, I think these guys are remarkable examples of the quality that's there, and we, we spend probably a little too much time evaluating the kids that aren't as mature and is ready to really represent the league as they should. Great point. And I think following up on, uh, on what uh, Coach Vermeil said, and I think it's, it's the game is, though it has its issues with concussions and, and discipline, and they have some decisions to make with relocation and all, um, from a 50,000 foot level, it's awfully healthy. You have a labor agreement that um, at least ostensibly is going to last for a while. And I think David Stern put it a good way in that he described it, you know, his battles in basketball with their players association. It, it's like a Thanksgiving meal where you have 100 people fighting for 20 hot dogs. And it, with football, he said it's, it's five people with 20 turkeys to divide up. There's enough to go around for everybody. And so I think that, that the issue is just how we exploit the NFL's dominance in, uh, you know, in terms of the, the fan popularity and all. Um, I, I agree with everyone here. I think the game on the field has definitely changed uh, as far as how it's played, how the players react to, different other, to other different players. But I, I come from the standpoint that the game off the field has changed as well where you have social media with different players doing different things. And when, even when I played, you know, 10 years ago, whatever, it was, it was much harder to get in trouble because you didn't have everyone taking pictures, taking videos and things like that. Now these players have to have that social conscience that says, you know what, I may still be doing something right, something lawful, but I don't necessarily want this on TV and I don't want this on the internet and things like that. And I don't want this representation of myself out there. So these players have to be a little bit more mature. And we've seen over the last couple of years that these guys actually aren't. And they have to be more thoughtful and mindful of the things they're doing on and off the field because this is their brand. This is what they're representing, uh, their team, their family, God, everybody else. And I don't think some of these kids are actually ready for it and they have to find a way to become ready very quickly. Yeah, I want to follow up on that, Brian, because this renewed emphasis on conduct and so much coverage, Jane, myself, everyone covering all these, I think that the two most talked about players in the league may have been two running backs, Adrian Peterson and Ray Rice. Neither of them played uh, over the past eight months. So as two running backs, and I want to ask Dave to chime in representing so many players, what, where do you go if you're advising young players? Where do you go in terms of, it's, it's not enough to say, hey, cameras are out there everywhere. What are the intrinsic qualities you're looking for that can keep them out of the misconduct, the bad news, the cell phones? What would you say? What yeah, do I you mean, say, it, Dave? It, it has, as Brian alluded to, it's changed dramatically since Jeff hired me in whenever it was, 1640 or so. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 it, it has become far more of an issue to deal with every day. We're a few weeks uh, before the draft, and I have 15, 20 players who I would love to have sit in a closet somewhere away from, from uh, the, any possibility of getting, getting into trouble. I think, you know, that, that um, the first thing that I do, and this is a selfish motivator, is you look for guys who 
maybe aren't going to be in that category. You know, the Aaron Rodgerses and the John Lynches and those guys and the work Dunn's. Um, uh, uh, but with with anybody, there are just certain rules that you have to apply to them. Where um, don't go out, stay at home. You know, there it, there is so much less that can happen in, inside the four walls of your home than than out and about. And then just all the normal things. Nothing good happens after midnight. Um, uh, you know, something. <laughs> uh, well, nothing good with them at least. But but. Um, and, and, and I think that it, it really is something where more and more as the years go by, I really have seen players become more responsible, more self-aware. Um, at least the players that I represent coming into the league, they know not to have Facebooks and they know not to have, you know, tweet inane things. Um, and, you know, the social media phenomenon has created a responsibility, which is a good thing. Well, I would say, you know, because a lot of the players now are a lot of millennials, you know, they want success now. So it puts a pressure on uh, those guys to perform in the field, but also to uh, watch what they do socially off the field. And I just think it's hard to put kids in a box that uh, you have to be in before 12 o'clock or to stay off social media. I just think their responsibility level, it's deeper than just that individual. It's their surroundings, that you know, the people in their environment every day. And uh, once guys are get dra once they're drafted, once guys go to uh, camp or get invited, I mean, they have rules of engagement. It's every team, every ball club have their rules. These are the do's and don'ts in the community. These are the things that we're by by, that we have to abide by as a football team. And I just think some guys are mature on the field, but they're immature off the field. And social media is gonna be there. It's a different beast, it's a different animal. But I just think it takes time for guys to really understand the magnitude uh, of using social media. Uh, the magnitude of, well, if this happens, then I can potentially lose millions of dollars of endorsements or contracts and so forth. So I just think it's a domino effect. And this one thing I think the league is working on, I'm on the con NFL Conduct Committee. So it's one thing that we're working on as a league is to figure out how do we better educate these players coming into the league about the do's and don'ts, but also all of the viable platforms that they, they have out there to to educate them on, but also give them resources that if something happens, you can also have a fallback guy. So, you know, it's it's a big problem. I don't think we can solve it in one instance and putting them in the box. But I, I think overall, you have to give them different opportunities to continue to educate themselves. But where's the responsibility lie? Is it is it at a league level? Is it at an agent level? A union level? Uh, is it is it with the colleges? You know, I understand at some level, you know, families, parents, et cetera, are all responsible. But but where does the responsibility lie when these players become professionals? Who who should take the real responsibility here? Well, I think you know the, the NFL has changed since me and Warwick was in the league. When I first came into the league, we had a bunch of older players that were like Westbrook, you ain't doing this, you're not doing that. And okay, you can have fun on Thursday night, but Friday night you're in the house. And so, and so things are changed now. You're talking about 30 year old plus players that are saying to a rookie, this is okay, this is not okay. Now, because the NFL has changed a little bit, now the old guy on the team is 27. And so he's still in the club, he's still going out. And, and so his ability to teach these younger guys, 21 year olds, to do the right thing or this is the wrong thing, his ability is a little bit great because he doesn't quite know himself. And as we age, we mature, and we do the right thing a little bit more, hopefully. And at some point, when you start getting rid of these older guys because you don't really want to pay them and you'd rather pay an inexpensive younger guy, you're losing something else. And part of that is that leadership that you've lost because of these older guys. In the NFL, they have to be responsible for that too. The commissioner has to say, okay, this is what we're doing, and we're losing these guys. And how do we make sure that these young guys continue to get it? It's nice to have the rookie symposium. That's great. But what about the second year guys? What about the guys that are in third year and they're 23 years old? 
and they still have no clue about life. They don't know how to conduct themselves outside of the four walls of the football, uh, the, the locker room and things like that. They're in trouble. And if they don't have anybody to turn to like the older guys, but they're turning to somebody that's just their same age, they're going to continue to make those same mistakes. And unfortunately, the, the people that we look up to, that our young kids are looking up to, they're looking up to guys that are making them big time mistakes. And I don't think as a community, as, as a people, we, we can really afford that. Coach Vermeil. Well, I, you know, I, have an, I had an advantage because I started out in high school coaching, and then I went junior college coaching, then in college coaching. And so I saw the maturity levels of all, all the way up into the NFL, and there's no correlation between maturity and age. Okay, you know, you can have a, <laughs> there just is no correlation. And with that background, it helped me when I got into the National Football League to recognize, first off, players win games, not coaches. And it was going to be my job to help them be the best they could be. And that many times started with a process before they ever got on the field, a process of, of, of assuming the responsibility for their own performance on and off the field, uh, assuming uh, the responsibility for carrying on uh, their conduct off the field as well as on the field and representing their own families. Now, you get some problems there because some of these kids have come from very dysfunctional families. I mean, I could write a book about some of the stories that I've heard. But and then as a coach and a coaching staff, integrating all the things that would help the guy become the best he could be. Now, I'm cheating because I learned a lot from John Wooden. But uh, you coach him in every way uh, because it's easy for someone who's continually told how good he is and how bright he is and how fast he is to become a little arrogant and think he's maybe a little above. Maybe he got away with a speeding ticket. Maybe because of who he was or his jersey number. And I, th I think it's a coaching staff's responsibility and a program's responsibility within the NFL. They have the player programs, programs where you have a guy and a staff that's hired to really work with these kids. And some organizations just do a great job with that. And, uh, but to coach the total person that will eventually help him be the best he could be on the field, then you look pretty smart as a coach. Well, that is a John Wooden model, too. And, you know, I, I, I think that's a great point. Um, Warwick, I mean, your perspective as to how the Falcons handle it, is it a coaching responsibility down there? Is it an organizational responsibility? Well, or do it, they look the other way and rely on the league and the union? No, I mean, it starts from the top. I mean, I think Mr. Blank, you know, he's the majority owner. I mean, he's very engaged and, and wants to know every aspect of the organization. But ultimately, we have standards at the top, but it, it's to the coaches, like Coach said. It starts with the coaches. The coaches, the head coach has to manage everybody, and he delegates the rest of the coaches to manage their players. When I was in Tampa and I played with Co under Coach Dungy, uh, Tony Dungy, we had Warren Sapp. And... Um, you know, he was a guy who came into the league with a lot of question marks. And that was one guy who his responsibility was to manage that guy. And I think he did a tremendous job of managing Warren Sapp at that time. And you have to have coaches that are, are that have the ability to command the respect, but also set the rules and boundaries that guys are going to abide by. I mean, when I was in college, I had Coach Bobby Bowden. I mean, he treated me... And like all of his players, like we were his own kids, his sons. And of course, guys made mistakes, guys got in trouble. I mean, he had rules, right? Three strikes. I mean, after that, if you can't get it correct, then we're gonna have to make some changes. And I, I think overall, you have to have a, a head coach or, or, and definitely, I know we have the uh, program directors and so forth on the teams that are their point of contact with the players to make sure that anything that they need, they have access to, if it's programs, continuing counseling, whatever it is, that they have access to that information. But it, ultimately, it comes back to the player. Are they going to abide by that? Are they going to use their resources? And sometimes that's a challenge to continue to follow up with guys. But the responsibility is on the organization, the head coach, but ultimately it's the player. We have to take responsibility ourselves to say, you know what, I'm going to maximize my opportunities to be the best person that I can be. I just want to echo what some of you guys have said about what the teams have in place. They already have, you know, a, a player engagement person on each team. And, and I can remember when I started covering the Jets that one of the players had his younger brother living with him as 
his family was in a pretty bad situation in South Florida and he wanted to have his little brother under his own roof. And, and that player engagement person would make sure that during away games, there was a, a that that child stayed with his own family. I mean, there's a very personal relationship sometimes. And, and you know, and, and this, this player was, uh, I think that they really cared about him, really tried to look after him, and, and he probably could have been cut a couple of times before he was. Um, but that is the level of the engagement that the teams have. And I don't know if that's necessarily fully understood. David, uh, you represent head coaches. Jim Harbaugh, Coach Kelly here in Philadelphia, uh, Jason Garrett in Dallas. I mean, I know the list goes on. What do those coaches say about this issue? about managing today's player in the league? I, I think uh, uh, all three of the, the, the NFL head coaches, one just departed NFL head coach, um, would have the same response, which is you look going in to the, the, the player evaluation process, you look at it awfully carefully. So, um, because the economics are so significant now, character takes a, on a, a much bigger role in the evaluation. And so that's the first step is be careful about uh, who's in the building. Um, and, you know, I think there's a, Ozzie Newsom, uh, one of his lines is that you can take on a couple of difficult guys if you have a bunch of good core guys to help them get better, so to speak. So I think, first of all, it's the evalu evaluation, and, and, you know, secondly, it's just placing rules uh, uh, on your players, and as Coach Vermeil did, sticking to them, no matter who they are, and, and that's sometimes difficult. I think that, that um, Jim particularly found it difficult in San Francisco, and he's faced a few things. Um, he faced a few things over the years, but I think it's just just running a tight ship and, and, and really holding everybody accountable. I, I follow up on that with Dave and Coach. I mean, ideally you want high character, smart, motivated guys. Everyone wants that. But like Coach talked about their strokes since they're in seventh grade, how great they are. Now we're hearing about reforms in an earlier panel with unionization, with paying college athletes. That's not going to help as an agent or as a coach dealing with enablement, entitlement, trying to manage that. Do you see it getting worse? Do you see less of the guys you're talking about coming into the league? Both of you guys. You know, I see, I see actually um, because the league has placed such a premium on, a premium on character, um, I see players reacting to it. Uh, there are more players like like Warwick who are entering the league who make good decisions, and this is in our sport. This is in, in football. I don't know whether it's whether it's the same in basketball or or baseball, but, but um, in football, as I go through the campuses every year, it really there really seems to be a little bit uh, yeah, less enabling um, going on, and and guys are a lot more focused on who they should be as much as how they should play. So I, I, to me, it's getting better. And it may be, again, it may be the, 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 my control group's not the right one. But, but um, to me, it's getting a little bit better. I, think, I don't think you are the right one. Because I think your practice, full of you know, not perfect citizens, certainly, but you know, many role models in the league, I don't think that's the right control group. The fact is, is that I think money, and I know I'm going to ask you a question when I get done making my opinion clear here, but I think the money in the league has changed the sport. It's changed the emphasis, compounded by social media. It's a, it's a, it's a challenge for, I think, for a head coach to tell a superstar player you know, who makes $10 million a year, which isn't necessarily the highest salary on the team, that he shouldn't be going out at night or that he shouldn't, you know, do certain things in his, in his private time. And I think that the economics of sport is what has really impacted much of the psyche. I 
frankly respect Coach Vermeil's comments that the league is at perhaps as good a place as it's ever been, but I still think the challenges of the money on all sides, team, league, players, agents, everyone involved, as it touches the various pieces of the industry, I think it's a real challenging component. Any thoughts? Well, you know, as a coach, you know, the money has grew so much over the years. I remember when I started in the league, there were players that had off-season jobs, and they came to training camp to get in condition to play the regular season. Now, training camps were longer, and they played more preseason games. But, you know, I've never been in my office where I felt a real quality, high-priced, quality player was negative influence on a daily basis coming to work and practicing and playing the game Sunday because he was making a lot of money. I can think of the Tony Gonzalez's and the Kurt Warner's and the Trent Green's and the Isaac Bruce's and, and the Marshall Falks. I'll tell you, during the week and in our meeting rooms and on the field, I, I never saw a negative uh, image in any way that money was driving them to be there. You know, maybe I'm blind, maybe I'm fortunate, I don't, I don't know, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad they're making a lot of money. And the, the big thing is uh, David Dunn's of the world has done such a great job of helping them do the right things with it. But, uh, geez, I've never been around a player that hated losing more than Tony Gonzalez, and he was the highest paid player in the tight end position of the league. And I'd, I'd, he'd be the last guy when we lost in a locker room to leave, and he might leave with tears in his eyes because he lost the football game. Still going to make the same money. He wasn't going to make more money this Sunday when he won than when he lost uh, last Sunday, you know. So it's, you know, I don't see any real negative th other than immature kids doing immature things with their money and getting poor direction. I've, I've had kids come in my office their first year, not so much late years, and you'll verify this, that their brother-in-law became their agent. I say, where did he go to law school? Well, he didn't went to college, you know. But he's going to help his brother-in-law make some money. You know, I mean, it's come that far, right, Dave? So anyway, I, I'm not a big believer the financial side of a player's uh, uh, career has been a negative. I, I do think that, that, as both Brian and Warwick alluded to, that money is a motivating factor on how you act. If you're, if you're going to lose six games um, autom automatically with any do domestic violence um, uh, uh, issue, that's going to motivate you, and, and it's clear that that Roger has a couple of things that he wants to emphasize. One is discipline, and the other is the, the move to Los Angeles of, of somebody. But um, uh, it's clear that the economics have changed since you did Steve Young's contract that made him the fourth or fifth highest paid guy in the league as a backup at two and a half million dollars, and now I have kickers and long snappers and, and backup guards who are making that much. It's, it's, I think that what it means for me and, and my clients um, is that as opposed to having to work a, a job in the off season, you can you know, do what these guys are doing, you can build empires. You, know, you can do what Drew Bledsoe's done and have a, a winery and, uh, you know, that's, that's making money and, and it, and it means that not only are you making enough money to, to last the rest of your lives, but you're making money that can uh, fulfill you not only economically, you know, in your 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. I see, I see money, at least in, you know, kind of looking at it from above as a driver for the league in terms of the way that it's t kind of reorganized that discipline policy because the real change came when there were sponsors that kind of threatened to pull out and when Budweiser issues a statement saying that the NFL, they're not sure that the NFL dovetails with its moral compass, then you know you have an issue. Um, when Radisson is pulling out of sponsoring the Vikings because they don't want their banner in front and behind Adrian Peterson, you know, that's a language that the NFL understands. So, I mean, even as it affects the players, it's definitely uh, makes an impact on the league as well. Brian and Warwick, there's this constant theme in sports that I've noticed over the years is guys who played 10, 20 years ago think it was much better back then, right? Better citizens, better players, better camaraderie, less problems. And certainly the guys playing now will be out of it in 10, 20 years, say it's much better then. I mean, are you... 
Are you realistic enough to say maybe that it's every generation that has the problems or that is that way or the other? And Coach, you can comment as well. Well, I know this, the locker room today in comparison to 1969 is so much cleaner. <laughs> and I'm not talking about laundry. I'm talking about drugs, alcohol, anything like that. There was no testing in the old days. And there were things going on that coaches pretended like they didn't see. Pretended. Uppers, daps, they called them daps. Hands full. I've seen it. Anyone who was coaching in the 60s and 70s saw it. When I came here, they'd had some problems. It took a while to clean it out. But uh, those things don't exist in the National Football League anymore. From time to time, someone's suspended for some kind of an abuse. But uh, it was dominating in those days, especially the older players. They needed to get up. <laughs> and then the trouble is, the low after taking all those pills to play on Sunday created such a low on Monday, they had to take them on Monday. <laughs> You know, so uh, I think the league, in, in every way that way, is so much cleaner and more sophisticated in the evaluation of what's good for that player and good for the organizations. And it's a safer investment in a quality player today than it's ever been. First off, people, someone asked me in the back room today, would you draft so-and-so at the quarterback position in the first round? I said, I don't know. Because first off, I'd pretend like it's my own money, my own millions of dollars. I'm taking them out of my pocket to invest in this person. And if there's some issues, then you may not make that investment based on the issues, not on the talent, but based on the issues, because it's not a good financial investment. And um, I, I did that in, in 1997 when I drafted Orlando Pace. There was no flaws. I had no, and they're doing a thing on it right now, drafting the first round perks. And uh, because I knew, we knew we were investing in a real quality product for our owner, and it's our owner's money. Um, I, I, I kind of agree with you that there, as, as a player, I, of course, when I played was the best time. Right. Um, <laughs> and things are worse now than they were when I played. But I guess that the problems are just different types of problems. Um, now with the social media and everything else, you know, everybody knows what's going on inside of a team. And there was a point where I know Andy used to tell us, you know, keep our problems in-house. Don't allow our problems to get outside because once you get them outside, the team, the coaches, the players can't handle them anymore. And now everyone knows what's going on in this house. And that, that's when things are starting to get ugly. And now because of the social media and things like that, everything is outside. It, you know what I'm thinking because I'm saying it on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And I, I don't know that, that that has made things better. I think it's made it a little bit more complicated for the players because – they have to have a filter, and some of these guys just don't have it at this point. You know, I'm not very bright, but uh, sometimes a very simple statement uh, catches their attention. I used to say, listen, guys, you are not Casper the Ghost, okay? Wherever you go representing the Eagles, the Rams, or the Chiefs, they know who you are. There are you aren't going to go out there. You are not a secret to the community to the bar you're in, or the restaurant you're in, or the movie theater. You are not Casper. Everybody knows you. You've got to assume that responsibility right now. And if you get in trouble for doing something, and someone's taking Facebook or picture, uh, I want you to be aware, aware that I'm warning you. If you don't respect that, it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Warwick, do you see the, the, the time you played like Brian as the golden era? Well, it was the best era. I mean, football was exciting, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it was exciting. It's, it's different now. To me, the game is soft. And, you know, it's just, it's a soft game. Guys don't practice anymore. They don't hit anymore. You know, Let me ask you seriously, because, you know, I've covered. That's the we, truth. We yeah. had Saul up here, the concussion. <laughs> no, seriously, the head trauma issue has become front and center all these years. Are you saying you hearken back to a days where that wasn't front and center? In protocols and awareness and taking people off the field? Well, I just think over the years, it's the evolution of, okay, it's every year it seems like there's something in the NFL that they put an emphasis on. And a couple of years ago, it was concussion. So they, they worked on a protocols and a process to help alleviate that. And, and now parents think, oh, if my kid plays football, 
but they're going to have concussions, they're going to have CTE, and they're not going to be able to survive when they're 50, 60 years old. And that's just, I don't think it's accurate. I mean, it's a lot of guys who played before us, yes, they, they have some, some, some issues, but it's also other guys that, that are just great individuals that are living a good life. And you do have that small segment of individuals that may be struggling. I think the league is trying to do a better job overall of, of uh, you know, trying not to forget the past, you know, trying to remember those guys and help those guys out, but it's bringing more awareness. It's not that, you know, playing football, you're going to have more concussions. You actually have more concussions riding a bike, playing soccer. People don't realize that. I mean, kids, they're not playing in helmets. They're out there running around hitting each other. I mean, it's, a, it's a tough sport, but I, I think the protocols over the years have just changed the game overall. Meaning training camp, I remember going to training camp, 21 straight days of two a days. I did not like the head coach. I mean, and I told him that to his face. I don't like you. It's 21 straight days, right? And I'm sure coach- I talked to you each one of those days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure coach remembers this. I mean, they had training camp, 20, you know, two a days hitting every practice. Today, these guys, I mean, they may have 10 practices all year. I mean. And pads. I mean, that's so what, why you what's better? The, what's better? Well, I just think the if you look at the game on the field, the, fun, the fundamentals are different. You know, uh, the game is not as clean. I mean, you don't have uh, uh, older guys. When I played, older guys, they would always say, you have to practice your craft. I mean, it wasn't, okay, let me be the biggest or fastest or strongest. It's always about the technique. And that's the one thing that I learned when I had the Harden Nickersons, the young Derrick Brooks of the world, is that they, all, they preach technique. And it's hard to practice technique when you're not practicing full speed. And sometimes that's putting on the pads and hitting. And I mean, this game, I agree. it's simple. <laughs> it's, you know, it don't take a rocket scientist to get the football, run. Just make everybody miss. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Brian can attest that. He was good at it. Too, yeah, I, I mean, it's just like, I didn't want to get hit, you know. And, <laughs> you know, today, it's just, it's a lot different because the game has evolved. The more emphasis on the quarterback and, you know, you can't take shots at guys. I mean, I remember talking to Ryan a lot a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, if a guy came across the middle when he was with the Niners, he would take a shot at him because he's sending a message. It is not going to happen today in my, in the middle of the field. He took a shot, that was a 15-yard penalty. A guy didn't run across the middle and catch that ball anymore. I mean, because he, he was setting the precedence for the rest of the day. Today, you can't have that. Guy's gonna get fined 15, 20, 30,000 dollars and possibly get kicked out of the game. So it has changed over the- Well, I'll tell you what I, my pet peeve today, and uh, I respect the players' union. I'm not a big union guy. I've coached their college all-star game three out of the last four years, I know. Some of the kids that run the Players Union, and specifically that game, they co I coached them, so I know them well. But I, I think the agreement that was made within the league and the Players Association to restrict the practices is not a real good thing. And uh, it, it, you wouldn't take your law students here and tell them they can't work two more hours of the day, so, because they aren't quite as good as the brilliant student, but they want to stay in school, so they have to keep working harder to stay there. But now everything is restricted, and you can't take kids that need more work to, that's going to provide them a better opportunity to make the roster and then grow and stay long enough to become a secure NFL player. And, uh, and the other thing is the, the fundamentals disintegrate because the tempo with which they practice on a consistent basis today is not as close to the game day situations. And football, believe it or not, is not a contact sport. It's a combat sport. You're in combat. An offensive lineman, defensive lineman, they're in combat every snap. And when you cut back and all that, then Sunday they're not as prepared for the tempo. I, I can't prove this, but I think there are more offensive linemen getting hurt today than ever because they stand up and play the game because they don't play the game low anymore. They're all standing up. Why? Because the, the tempos which, which they're coached and disciplined to play now is so much slower on a consistent basis, they're, they're not combat ready on Sunday. And uh, you have to use good judgment. And um, you're 100% right out. Training camps used to be much, much tougher than they are. And I believe in the moderation of it. And I believe we've got to solve the, 
the, Trust me. the concussion problems, but just, hey, just the reintroduction of the shoulder pad. When I first started coaching the NFL, the shoulder pads were out here. Now you can't even see them, <laughs> right? And it's because it became all helmet and hands. So there's a lot of things, but I, I just, uh, I, I don't talk to a head coach in the league that doesn't fight every day at wanting to spend more time with his players to help them be better in every way. In and this way. is, here we are in a law school. This is where law and business have collided yeah. Mm -hmm. With the game, Dave can speak to this as a player rep. What did the union want? Safety, health, benefits. The league was willing to give it to get their economic concessions. And now we have this new deal where I hear exactly from coaches what you're saying. We can't get in front of these players. You, know, you can't them. write them a letter. You can't talk football with the them. The letter you write is evaluated. Okay? I'm serious. I think I'm kidding. It's, I'm, I'm serious. The you know, I can't send Joe. I can't send you a letter. Tell you to drink my wine. You know. <laughs> well, the reality is when the CBA, and because I'm on both sides, right. player for twelve, and now a limited partner, you know, I see the economics aspect of it. But as an ex-player, I just like we just gave away too much, right? And I have to blame that on the executive director, you know, the players' association, because. Yeah, you, you want to advance guys when it comes to medical, so forth, and, and definitely looking out for retired players. But the, the nature of the game is, you know, during the season, I mean, do you want to do you want to have guys have more off season so they can go and travel the world? Or do you want to have guys who are focused on their craft that you have better control and you can see uh, you have more contact with these guys in off season, understanding what they're doing in their life. It, it's, we, we, I think we just lost a little bit of the connectivity with players and coaches in the front office because of a new CBA, and that's that's tough. I mean, yeah, there's no doubt that the it used to be that when would you have to report? Middle of March or so. Middle of right? March. Uh, yeah, and now March. now players, there are so many rules now. You know, players. I think are reporting now if if they have new coaches and, and in uh, a couple of weeks if if they have an old coach um, and there are rules limiting contact and how much the coaches can be with them so it probably diminishes the quality you're right of of the uh, of the product on the field. The issue though is that the fans would probably disagree with you because they're all they're all watching. You know, and sponsors are paying just as much as they ever have. And, and so if you have 114 million people watching the Super Bowl, which is more than all seven World Series games combined, um, there's not an economic motivator for the league to, or anybody for that matter, to well, shift Well, I'm things. not disagreeing with that being on the owner's side. I mean, I see the dollars and cents. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, from a player's perspective, I would say it's challenging because just like you said, I mean, when I was playing, we had to be there in March. I mean, now that we have a new head coach in Atlanta, the players were there this past week for the first time all year. And then they'll be there, they're going to be there till the middle of June, and it's no contact until training camp. I mean, that's tough, right? And, and what it does is it helps the teams that have been together for a while. Just because, you know, if you have these teams that are trying to build cohesiveness, uh, you can't get to where the Seattle's and the Green Bay's and, and those teams are. So there's such a uh, such a premium on keeping a good team together. Well, you see, in the old days, for example, you come into this league, you got Dallas Cowboys and Tom Landry, and they're beating you. And you could say, "All right, the only way we can catch up is try to work harder and longer." And today. Dallas Cowboys may be beating you. You take a new job. Normally, when a head coach gets hired, he gets hired to take over a losing team. He can't work any harder or any longer. He's got to rely on his personnel department and improving his personnel within the same amount of time that a team's been beating him for five years in a row. Tough. Really tough. It's tough to do. You can't do it in any other profession. You know, you've got to work. I, th I think some of the concern when the C new CBA was being drafted was that that the off season was just getting crushed by coaches who you know wanted to get in there earlier and earlier and and you know get their players together and that it ended up that you know that that the players were the ones who were constantly making the sacrifice on that end 
as, as for the two days, I, I started covering football back in the days of the two days, and I can, you know, it was hard out there standing on the field for two uh, practices, much less being actually in there. But the problem with that is the, uh, you know, it's soccer and, and bike riding, you know, a, a concussion is incidental. But with football, contact is the point, and that's why we love the game. Um, and so it becomes the cumulative effects, and what are the cumulative effects of those constant uh, head injuries, and, and are you are you getting some of those in these two days, and and back to back or more frequently, and 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 is there a way that we can keep the game strong but prevent some of that? And and I and I understand that you are not alone in thinking that it's gone too far the other way, but you know that was the union's concern. You, you know the the leadership of the Players Association is very good, very strong, and the people that make these decisions are the kids that already have security in the National Football League. They are the first round picks, the quality players, and they sometimes don't represent the average kid on the squad, and the guy's struggling to hang to keep his job every year. I promise you they would vote for more time, more fundamental work, more time with their line coach in the off season to help them develop the skills that will help them stay there longer. I mean, it's just, it's, a, it's, it's You guys are so in the <laughs> trenches, I feel like I have to present the outside view. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, last question. We, you, on this issue, work talked about playing through, basically, this tougher NFL. You and I have talked about where you just play through the dings, and even LaShawn McCoy going to advice for you about, you know, when he was out, and he had to get back in, and what do I do, Brian, and those kind of things. It's a different mentality now, right? So... You were playing today, you wouldn't have played through the dings because you wouldn't have been allowed to, it sounds like. Yeah, um, you know, when we played, it was to the point where when you got hurt, there was a, a, a inner force with your team, your coaches, everyone in the organization that you needed to be back on the football field. Uh, whether you were injured, hurt, or whatever it was, you needed to be back out there. Um, you know, I, I always laugh. We always used to laugh at basketball players and baseball players. They had a, a wrist injury, and they're out two, three weeks. A wrist injury for us would mean run to the training room, get it taped up, and get back on the field. And so things are a little bit different. Um, I, I personally think that the offseason should be longer. I think that the offseason, they're moving it into a better place to give these kids more time off. I think that um, even though I'm a little jealous that – these kids, aren't, they don't have as much contact in the, in, during the training camp. I, I wish I played during the time where we had less contact during the training camp. I remember when guys used to come to Andy, and Andy would say, listen, today we're tackling. And guys from other teams would be like, what do you mean tackling? You mean tackling to the ground? And they'd be like, that's the only way we do it here. We're tackling to the ground. And so that was the only way that we knew how to do it in Philadelphia. And you just wonder – the impact of those practices, those times that you got tackled, hit by different players on your own team, that you're not necessarily making money on game day, how did that impact your career? Did it cut off a year or two? Work played 12 years. Could he may play 15 if he didn't have those two a days? Um, to me, you have to live with those questions. Your, your knees, your ankles, your head, everything's bad. But if you would have cut back things just a little bit more, and it hasn't, you know, just like David mentioned, it hasn't decreased the, the public's want of the game. They, people still want to watch the game whether they have good fundamentals or not. Tom Brady's still throwing touchdowns. Peyton Manning's still throwing touchdowns. People are going to watch it, whether the all season is shorter or not. But the health of the players, the people that are actually on the field are impacted dramatically by the amount of practices that we have, the amount of contact practices we have. And the coaches, they don't like it, but they ain't playing. The players are playing. No, oh, and they weren't in the collective bargaining. Coaches yeah. weren't part of that. No, they, they weren't. And don't get me wrong. As a player, I wish I played in this era because, trust me, I would have played another three, four, five years. I mean, because the game is just easier, I just think, overall. But I just think, you know, it is a happy medium and not practicing and working on fundamentals and – practicing a little bit more and working on the fundamentals because I think for a guy who's undersized, who, you know, coaches, you guys have like the prototype player, you know, six foot, 220 abs, all this stuff, right? I mean, this is just the reality. And I'm the guy, 5'9", I was 170. So I had to do everything 
that I could to you know, prove that I can play the game. And I had to do it consistently over a period of time. It wasn't just handed to me. I had to prove it year in and year out. So I think having those training camps, having all of those practices where I can work on those little things, the techniques, taking the right step, because as you get older, you get a little slower. But at the same time, just because a young guy comes in, I mean, I can still get to the same point just as fast as him because I have a better understanding of how to get there, the right technique to take. And the younger guy just comes in, just think he's just brute strength. I'm just going to rip, dip, and do everything else. And, you know, you need that time to continue to grow as a player. And I think the game became easier as you, you get older, but we just went away from the fundamentals of the game. When I watched the game, <laughs> I mean, I'm in the box with the other owners, and you know, they're complaining about this or that. I'm just like, well, you know, he has high shoulder pads. I mean, he's not low. I mean, the guy took the wrong step to block to reach the tackle. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the game from a different lens, and it's just it's sad to see because, I mean, it's, You're so angry, it's aren't just, you? Yes, yeah. I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, I, you know what I hey. think, though? I think it, it makes – it puts the emphasis on the players – to put in more work alone. You talked about those guys that get there early and stay late. The coaches are only going to be there six of those hours. So if you use two hours before and two hours after, that's four more hours each day that you have the ability to go there and work. And some of these young guys, we've seen them all, uh, they're not willing to put in that time. And just like War saying, if you want to be good in this game, any profession really, you got to put in the work. And some of these young guys are just raw talent. And that's it. But the, the difference between a true professional, a guy that's going to be take their game to the next level, is their ability to put into work, put in the work. And it works a little bit facetious here. Now he went to Florida State and they take care of their players. So he made more Stop money it. in college Stop. than he what? did <laughs> at uh I am I mean, I'm not saying anything, but you know. Hey, 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 hey. Well, Stop, you, it. Stop, Stop it. Stop it. That's why I put you two That's apart. Yeah. <laughs> they just they just brought a quarterback here from the Rams, named Bradford, a right? fine player, came out of college and all you read about, can he play? Well, if he's healthy. Well, the reason he got his last knee was the left tackle with terrible fundamentals. I saw it happen. And he was a former first-round pick that they signed in free agent to play left tackle, gave him a lot of money. The only reason Bradford got hurt is the fundamentals that on that specific play with that offensive lineman got the quarterback killed. So how do you improve that tackle, even though he's been a first-round pick? So you keep Bradford healthy. So there's, there's a lot of carryover into the position. How does he stay healthy if the offensive line is not fundamentally sound? You know, Run for your life. And, or, you know, <laughs> if, or if Andy, if Andy Reid doesn't from time to time say, hey, today we're going to hit. You know? and plus then you see the game at the level it's going to be played on Sunday, and you respond and react and protect yourself at the same tempo as someone else uh, preparing to help you advance the football. So it's, it is such a complex team game, and it all has to be worked together. And it takes, you know, they've got so many great coaching staffs. When I came here, we had 10 assistant coaches. I had the largest staff in the league by three guys. Today, when I was the Chiefs, I had 20. I, I was a lot smarter, I'll tell you that. I mean, you got 20 guys. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, it, most of the changes have been really f for the good. You know, I think about uh, the changes in tackling to prevent some of those helmet-to-helmet -helmet tackles. Um, and I covered Dustin Keller and, and uh, a tight end in Miami who his knees were pretty much destroyed by a low tackle, which I think is, you know, something to try to avoid some of that helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact. Which, by the way, if you're watching the game on Sunday, you see in every game still, pretty much. I mean, and, and the cameras linger and replay it. So... Yeah. You know, as much as we're trying to avoid that, how successful are we really? Right. I've been part of that evolution. Tomorrow night, or Saturday night, I'll be at Hillsdale High School in San Mateo, my first coaching job. And a lot of the kids that I coached at that time will be there. We taught them to tackle with their shoulder pad. And over the years, I think it really came out of Oklahoma. I'm not too sure, but I think it did. The evolution and the... the the feeling that the helmet was now a quality piece of protective equipment for me to hit with enhanced the use of the helmet as a weapon to tackle with. And, uh, but in the old days, you had a shoulder pad. 
That's just, that's how we, that's, we taught it every day on the practice field. So it was different. But I, I think we can uh, move the game into where you get a, a, the more use of the shoulder pad and discipline the sparing and really truly using that protective helmet as a weapon. And that's what they're really trying to fight, I think. We'll give uh, owner Don the last word. Okay. So just so you know, the NFL, they are taking uh, the necessary uh, steps to make sure that the kids who are playing youth football are getting the proper coaching and right. technique. So right. I know they have heads of football that all these coaches have to be certified, go to clinics and so forth, because it does start from the, the bottom. But when kids try to emulate pros, they, they, they want to do what the pros do. So you want the coaches who, could, who have a better influence over them day to day to teach them the fundamentals of the game early on the proper way to block, the proper way to tackle, protect themselves when they're playing a game of football. So all these mothers know that your kids are going to get great technique if the Little League teams are part of heads of football. One last, because the concussion thing is a big thing today. One last statement in regard to my personal career. My career's over. I finished at Kansas City. A year later, Trent Green, my quarterback that I brought there from the Rams, gets a severe concussion. He's out six weeks. The Saint, this is 2007, I think it is. Uh, yeah. The Chiefs send him to the two leading experts in the United States in regard to concussion evaluation and everything else. And he eventually came back and played after a number 10 weeks, I think it was. I'm with Trent, and I said, Trent, are you entering the lawsuit against the league in regard to concussions? He says, no, I'm not, coach. I says, why not? You should protect yourself. He says, well, I went to the two leading people in our country, and they did not have any early research on concussions in regard to NFL football players. So he said, how can the league be hiding information that no one's organized and put together yet? Now, this is what my quarterback told me, and I, I respected him for being so honest and open about it. But it's, the concussion thing has become now, the awareness has created people doing research, and, and, and league and other people pouring money into the research, and we're finding out a lot of things. But I, I don't think... Any team that I coached all the way back to night was hiding in information. We didn't have, no one ever came into my office and said, here's a study that shows you if Warwick Dunn gets a concussion, he, sh he should stay out for six weeks, and this, these are all the repercussions if he don't. I never saw any of that stuff. Hope you enjoyed going inside the curtain here. <laughs> Jane McManus, Warwick Dunn, Coach Dick Vermeule, Dave Dunn, Brian Westbrook. Thank you.